Let's open up our Bibles to Matthew chapter 10, the gospel, as we continue to teach through the gospel of Matthew, we will be looking at verses 34 through 42 to finish up this chapter. Pretty much the whole chapter has been spoken by Jesus himself. In the last section of this chapter, can be very difficult for some to understand because Jesus will lay it out very clearly what a true Christian believer is and how he will rub some the wrong way. My message this morning is themed, Do Opposites Attract? Do Opposites Attract? I know in relationships, when you have opposites, it's not always a good thing to have opposites. There's always struggles and complications in those opposites. Um, you want to try to be equally yoked, as the Bible says, in your relationship. It's a lot easier that way. And I encourage you, if you're in a relationship, to try to get equally yoked. And what I mean by that is that the other person is a believer, a true believer, and is just on fire uh, about Christ as you are and has the same faith and doctrines as you do. Make sure of those things, and I think that your relationship will be blessed. Uh, in the world itself, in the mechanical world itself, we know that magnets uh, don't uh, attract in the opposite direction. They actually repel each other in, the, in, in such a powerful way. In fact, in science itself, they're coming up with all kinds of uh, ideas where they're causing devices like uh, metal to float on tracks because of either uh, magnetic fields or uh, other type of sciences. And so they, they, they can show the uh, uh, detraction and the opposing uh, forces there and they can float. So we know that opposites really don't attract. It's rare that they do. Some will receive the message of Jesus with hope and joy, while others will reject, reject it with hostility. I have a friend of mine who's uh, someone that I knew since high school, and he is one that is hostile towards Christianity. Uh, the kingdom message of Jesus brings strife and conflicts. We need to understand that as Christians, that the message of the gospel will bring conflict and even hostility to those around us. Jesus will deal with difficulties in the ministry for the disciples. He's basically been laying out for them the whole road that they will encounter once he is uh, ascended up into heaven. Once, once the crucifixion and the resurrection takes place and he sends them off to the upper room and they will be anointed by the Holy Spirit, then everything that he has taught them in these last several chapters that we've been going through uh, in the past weeks of months uh, will come true. They will now walk by faith in the power of the Holy Spirit, and they will encounter what Jesus will share with them uh, today. But Jesus' claim here in these uh, few verses is that he is the cause of the uh, hostility, of the rejection, of the conflict and strife. And so we need to understand that as believers, that it is not us, though we may feel like, what am I doing wrong? Why are they so opposed to me? Uh, why is this so hurtful to me? But we need to realize it's not me, it's not us, it's Jesus that they're opposed to. It's his truth that they don't like. It is uh, their relationship with him that they're struggling with and not you. You're just the messenger giving that message of love and hope and grace and they're the ones rejecting it. So Christ divides families and he starts there with the disciples. He wants them to understand that it starts with the family itself because you're a family. Uh, we're all involved with a family of some sort, a father, a mother, brothers and sisters, you know, and so forth. So let's go ahead and read this uh, first section here of this morning's text, 34 through 39, and then we'll finish up with the last few verses. Jesus says, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me 
is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. So you get what I said earlier, difficult passage to, to really grasp and take hold of. It is truth. It is what Jesus said will happen, and it does happen to this very day. Notice a couple of things in verse 35. For I have come to set a man against. Uh, that is very clear, that the gospel message will set you against men and men in your own family. Also notice that he says several times that uh, more than me is not worthy of me. If you love father or mother more than me, then you're not worthy of me. If you love son or daughter more than me, then you're not worthy of me. And if you don't pick up your cross and follow me, then you're not worthy of me. He says that three times. And so that's something that we really need to think about. Are we worthy of Christ? Well, I think in our own flesh, and our own strength, no, none of us are ever worthy of Christ. But if we have a relationship with Christ, if we have surrendered to him, our hearts, our desire should be to please him. And in pleasing him, we need to stand up for truth and for righteousness. So let's look at these verses a little bit closer and get some definition here. Look at verse 34. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. Well, I thought that's why you came to bring peace on earth. Christ came to bring division also though. My first point is, is that Christ came to bring division, not necessarily peace. When he uses the word bring, it's to throw or to cast. And the picture here is that we see is that the disciples are kind of on earth and they're looking up eagerly for the peace that God's going to throw down to them. And so they're hoping for that peace as they're walking with him and listening to him about the kingdom of God, about these truths and so forth. And they're hoping God's going to bring us peace, maybe deliverance from the Roman Empire, deliverance from our enemies, and we will finally have this peace cast down from heaven. Dr. Morris gives a picture and he says, all are on tippy toes of expectation. What is, is that is about to happen? Is it the reign of peace that is just about to be inaugurated and consummated is there henceforth to be only unity and amity as they muse and debate lo a sword is flung into the midst of it he says the ultimate goal of god is to bring peace in a chaotic world definitely but what kind of peace are you talking about we have to define that word peace first peace with god we have to make peace with God. We have to get right with God. We have to surrender to God and to his will. And there's a peace that comes with our salvation. I am saved, I'm being saved, and I will be saved in the future. There's a peace there. I know I'm going to heaven. I know I'm a child of God. And so everything else around me may be crumbling and falling, but I have a peace that I'm going to heaven one day. And we all should have that peace. Well, what about peace in the world? Well, Jesus made it very clear that in this world, we will not have peace. We will have tribulation. We will have problems. But he said, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Again, uh, falling back on our salvation, our eternal state, and we have peace with God. But in this world, there's not always peace. There's times of peace, kind of like that tree planted by the river of water, Psalms 1, right? And in its season, it gives forth its fruit as it grows. But there's peace in times, but not all the time. And so in this case here, the word peace is used only a few times in Matthew's gospel. He doesn't put a lot of emphasis on the word peace here. In fact, he only uses it here and in verse 13. But in giving that peace, it will offend others. And that is Jesus's point. Someone said, truth provokes opposition. Pureness inspires animosity. And righteousness arouses all the forces of evil. Isn't that true? When you think about it, when you, when you begin to share truth, don't people get offended at that truth? They do get offended because of that truth. Or, or when you're trying to live a pure life and someone that you know maybe is a friend of yours is unpure, you'll offend them because you're trying to live that pure life. Or trying to live righteously, uh, evil will try to come against you. 
There's always differences between the converted soul and the unconverted soul. There should be. And there should be a big difference between your life as a believer and my life with those that are unbelievers. Big difference. There should be such a difference that they begin to despise you or dislike you. Matthew 10, 21 says, Now brother will deliver up brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. And so he encourages us there, Jesus, that we should endure these times when there are struggles in our relationships with others. Because he said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword, a sword there. And that word sword there stands as an image of destruction and hostility towards unbelievers. It's hard to picture Jesus that way, isn't it? Because we live in a world that wants to have love and everything is about love, but that love yet has its limits. Love does not mean that we embrace sin or accept sin or tolerate sin. Love suggests that we deny sin and deny evil because that destroys and kills humanity. And so true love hates sin, but the world doesn't like that because it embraces sin and lives by sin. So the peace Jesus came to bring is not simply the absence of strife. It is a peace that means the overcoming of sin and the bringing in of the salvation of God. And that means war with evil and accordingly hostility against those who support the ways of evil. In order for peace to reign, battles must be fought against sin and evil. Isn't that true? That's why we fight battles and wars today. There's a, there's a, bat, a physical battle in our country and in other countries against Muslims, uh, extreme Muslims, a certain group of Muslims that are what we consider terrorists. And there's a battle and a war. And so that means we have to stand up and rise and fight against those things. And so anything... Uh, that we see as being evil, uh, we stand up and rise. If someone were to come and harm one of your children, wouldn't you stand up and fight against that person? You sure would. It reveals your heart and your love for your children. And so there will be fighting against sin and evil. Now, in verses 35 and 36, uh, Jesus offers support here of verse 34. The focus on family and how the sword has come to the family unit itself. And so he gets at the heart and the core here of verse 34. This peace that I brought and this sword that I brought will affect your immediate family. And I know all of you know what I'm talking about, those of you that are Christians. Look at verse 35. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother. The word against in the Greek means to cut into two parts to cleaver or asunder, sever. That's what the sword does. And, and he has come to do that with families. Now, I thank God that when I first got saved, God saved me in such a radical way. My life just went 180 degree turn. And I remember that Saturday running to my mom's house about 45 minutes away from Redlands. And I just went through the door because I had a key, went to her, her room, knocked on the door and she says, come in and she's half asleep. And I said, you need Jesus Christ. You know, and so she kind of woke up and says, okay, you know, I, I got Jesus. No, you need to surrender your life. You need to confess him with your mouth. You need to say these words. And she did. <clears throat> and I thank God that, that he gave me that boldness to, to share that with my mom, my sisters, and my brothers. And so my mom is saved and my sisters are saved, but my brother still isn't saved. And so there is some division. There is a sword within our family because of Jesus Christ and the gospel message. He has divided us to a certain degree. But I thank God that my mother uh, loves the Lord Jesus Christ. She, she, I called her up yesterday. She was supposed to be here to look at the uh, trailer and some of the work that we're doing here on the property, but she, she um, <clears throat> didn't make it. So I called her up and asked how she was doing. And she went and saw the, the movie Risen. And so from her perspective, she's still a child in the Lord and she just loves the Lord so much. She says, my heart was hurting 
It was just hurting as I was watching the movie. It's like I was having a heart attack because she could just relate uh, to the whole risen thing and the story and so forth. And I, I just almost started crying, you know, because she just has such a love for Jesus Christ. One commentator said, since the father <clears throat> was the head of the household, the loyalty owed to him was above most loyalties, uh, perhaps above all. To bring division between father and son was to offend against one of the most deep-seated convictions in the mind of Jesus' hearers. The mother was just as important of a person in the female section of the household where she exercised a headship to that of father over the whole household. Jesus did not come to deliberately separate families, but he knew that division would occur because of faith in him. And he warned his disciples. So a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Now the mother-in-law is the same person as the mother there. New, newly wedded uh, couple. Uh, tradition was we have a household here of five people and, and they're living together in this household. <clears throat> tradition was when the son married uh, a woman, the woman usually came to that household and became a part of that household and, and, and lived and dwelled there in, in their property. And so Jesus describes now that household in verse 36. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. And Jesus is speaking here from personal experience because his own family was divided. His stepbrothers were mocking him a little bit. Well, why don't you go down there and show yourself if you'd like to see them saved, you know? Go down there now. He says, no, my time's not ready. You go down there. Later on, we find that they did come to surrender their lives to Jesus Christ. But Jesus totally gets it. He understands the, the demographics of it all and, and how it all functions and works within the family. And at this particular time, they were totally against him. So Jesus claims in verses 37 through 39 to be responsible for that com uh, family conflict. Look at verse 37. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Notice the, the gender uh, does not play in this equation. It doesn't matter father, mother, brother, sister at all. It's not gendered at all. Uh, Jesus is saying, look, uh, you will have division in your family. It is affection and love that binds a household together, right? It really is. You think about yourself and your household. Virginia and I met at the age of 13. We had Modesto at the age of 16, 15, 16. We had the rest of our kids by the time we were 21. <clears throat> and you have two, your kids. We put our hearts into our family, Virginia and I. We, we love our boys to death. We poured into them uh, spiritually. <clears throat> we poured into them physically. Uh, we trained them. We equipped them. We were a unit. We did things together, vacation, beaches, parties, fun, um, <clears throat> everything that is manageable. Even in their schooling, we were involved, we participated in their sports activities. It was our family. And that's what families do. They're deeply connected to one another. They're, they grow up together. You cry together, you weep together, you fight together. You have fights that no one else knows about, but just you and your family. Deep, deep ties, emotional ties, struggles that have happened. And Jesus is trying to get us to understand that. That most families are bound together by years and years of love and nourishment and relationship. And the Bible tells us that love is the main central theme. Jesus came because of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That ever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. They came to him as teacher. What's the greatest commandment? And he said, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then love your neighbor as yourself. And then he went on to say, on these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. However, family devotion should not supersede devotion as deeply rooted 
as families can be, they are not to supersede our relationship to Christ. This is exactly what Jesus is saying here. So he says, he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. This is important. The implication here in understanding the person of Jesus Christ and what he just said is great. He's not just a man. He's not just a prophet. He's not just a little Jewish boy who grew up in the community. What Jesus is saying here, which none of us could say that you are to love me more than your parents, more than your sons, more than your daughters, more than anyone else. Only Jesus could say this because what he's saying is I'm God. I'm deity. I am everything. And you must surrender totally to me and love me more than even your family. That's a hard concept for some of us. I know it's one that's hard for us. I remember when I first read the story about how when we get to heaven, there will be no more marriage. Now, I know some of us might be rejoicing. <laughs> I wasn't. When Virginia and I first read that, we looked at each other and I go, you got to be kidding me. You mean we won't be married together anymore? See, me and Virginia have been together since 13 and we are deeply connected. I mean, I love her with all of my heart. I would die for her at any moment. That's how much I love her. Even though, uh, to be honest and, and truthful here, and maybe I shouldn't say this, but we are so opposite from each other. Talk about opposite tracks. They don't, we don't. But yet there's such a deep love for one another. And when we read that, we're like, you're kidding me. I'm not going to be married to you anymore. I, I don't know about this. I, I don't know if I'm willing to, to, to you know, uh, I'm willing to give up heaven, I guess. But I guess I have no choice because if I want heaven then you're going to be there, uh, it definitely has to be better, right, than what we have now. But that kind of scared me at first because I don't want to be separated from my wife. We always kid each other uh, as to who will go first, you know, and, and I'm like, I better go first because if you go first, I'm going to lose it. And so I hope I go first before you do. But that deep love that we have one for another, Jesus is basically saying, I have to come first beyond that. Christ is to be loved above all. He must be first in the life of a believer. We must be aware of making idols of even our dearest loved ones by loving Jesus more than anyone else. Our love for Christ has to be supreme even above those of family members. If they are not united with us in the faith, they are not a part of the kingdom of the light. They must be united with us. They must be a part of our faith. Don't forget that Jesus knew what it was to experience this. His own family, as I said, rejected him. Now we find in verse 38, the burden of loving God more than your own household. Uh, it, in parallel with the two family statements comes a statement about taking up your cross here. So look at this burden. So he goes on in verse 38. So he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. His cross. He uses a phrase that anticipates in view of the crucifixion that he's about to die on. The Jewish people did not understand that. They didn't accept the crucifixion. It wasn't their punishment. And so Jesus is using something that will happen in the future. It was something that was done all the time in that area. The Romans uh, were crucifying criminals and uh, people that were coming up against the Roman government and, and so forth. And, and, um, it was well known, but the Jews didn't accept it. But Jesus is giving that picture like that cross as a criminal carries his cross. So you are to carry the cross. But uh, as I was looking at this, the Lord just really showed me something. I know sometimes we look at this cross and we think, well, what is it? Is it different for all of us? You know, we all have a different cross to carry. Yes, I, I agree with that. But I think in the context, the greatest cross is to love God more than anyone else. That's the cross that he's talking about, even your own family. If we were to put it in today's vernacular, we would probably say, uh, pick up, uh, you know, instead of pick up your cross, place yourself on the firing line. Or put your neck in the, loose, in the noose. Or put your head on the chopping block, Jesus would say. In other words, pick it up and carry it. This is required of you. Otherwise, you're not worthy of me. 
Spurgeon said we are not to drag the cross after us, but to take it up and joyfully. It is a cross that God has given to us who himself bore. He said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. And when you're in love with someone, it is easy and it is light. I know I would carry a cross for my wife. I would die for my wife, as I said earlier, but I would also die for my Savior. I would carry that cross for him. And there have been times, personally speaking here, that in our own family, that sword has come in. And because of my study of the scriptures, I mean, I study a lot in the Greek and the commentaries and just Matthew in itself. I probably have over four, uh, four or five commentaries this turn, but last time another six. So 10 commentaries of reading and studying and understanding these scriptures and standing on them even when my own children have not agreed with me because I love my Lord more. I may be wrong. Yeah, I may be wrong. Sure, that's a possibility. But I stand on it because it's what I believe. No matter what, God wants us to follow him. And the call is that we make, we have to understand is dangerous and it's a selfless choice to follow Jesus. Now verse 39 explores this same idea, the picking up the cross of loving him more with the imagery of the cross and the sword. And this is my second point that we are to lose our life. We are to lose our life. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. One commentary said uh, to concentrate one's best energies on oneself is to destroy oneself. Whereas to lose oneself in the service of Christ is to find oneself. That's hard to understand because picking up one's cross and denying oneself means that you are not giving in to your ways or your goals and your plans, but it's God's ways and his goals and his plans. I, I shared with you in the past, I wanted to be an architect. I had plans, but it wasn't God's plans. I'm here standing behind this pulpit as a witness to this truth that God wanted me to be a pastor and a teacher and not by my will. It was against my will to do that. I never intended to be, nor did I want to be. And there are times I still want to run away from it because of the responsibility. But I am here because I submit myself to God. And sometimes I'm like Jonah, wanting to go the other way. Uh, you know, some, someone uh, uh, asked me the other day why I, um, actually they, they, they were giving me a compliment. Uh, I think, it, yeah, it was rust. And, and this happened years ago where I, I learned this years ago. Uh, when God sends someone to a person and that person's ministering to them, I don't get involved with that because God sent them. And so I don't want to all of a sudden jump in there and not know what's going on and what the spirit is doing. So I just back off. And he appreciated that of me because he was ministering to someone the other day and I just backed off. And I says, well, in reality, you know, sometimes I don't even know what to say. And so I'm so fearful that I'm going to say the wrong thing. I don't even want to get involved, you know, because it's a scary place to be. You got to be right on and you pray and you seek the Lord and hopefully you say the right thing. I'll do it. But man, I, I fear that um, it, it might be the wrong thing. And so Jesus is saying here, you got to lose your life. He who finds his life will lose it. You got to lose it. Have you ever heard someone say, I'm losing it? You know why they're saying I'm losing it? It's because they're living for self. That's why they're saying that. Think about that for a second. I'm losing it here. I have no control of this. I'm not getting what I want. I'm just losing it. Exactly. It's because you're living for self. You wouldn't be losing it if you live for God because he's in total control. And he has you on a path and you trust in him and you have faith in him. And so you just know he's, he's going to take care of you. And so you're not losing it. You're just saying, Lord, you take care of it. Oftentimes when things aren't going right, when things aren't happening in the way that I like them to happen, I'll just say, Lord, that's your problem, not mine. You called me to this ministry, not me. This is your work. These are your people. This is your church. This is your community. I'm just a servant. So... It's yours, not mine at all. You remember the battle that Moses and God had on the way down from Mount Sinai? God said, Moses, your people are down there sinning. Moses says, God, they're your people, not my people. And they're going back and forth. You know, that's how I feel sometimes. And I just says, Lord, they're yours. This is your work, not mine. This is 
something that you're doing and I just get to participate in it. We need to lose our life. Those who do not take up the cross in discipleship and love for Christ lose their lives in the time of judgment. How could they have a relationship with God? He who loses his life for my sake will find it, he says. The one who loses his life for Jesus will find meaning and eternal life. One of the major problems of our society today, again, as I said, is self-centeredness of man. By nature, we're just self-centered. I mean, just look at a child. Look at a little child and how everything's about them. Uh, they cry because they're hungry. When they want something, they will do whatever it is they need to do to get that thing and when you try to take something away and they get to that certain age it's mine 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 you can't have it and if someone else has something that they didn't care about earlier all of a sudden they see someone else they go over there and say that's mine too give me it you know because they're very selfish it's just by nature that we're selfish we don't know how to lose our lives for christ I was reading a devotion and it was uh, themed being called to Christ. I want to read a, a couple of uh, things out of it for you. It says, there are believers who have trusted in Jesus Christ as their savior. And there are actually followers of Jesus Christ. These are the few who passionately pursue the Lord's will in all things. These are the ones who take their, res their relationship with Jesus seriously. These are the disciples of Christ. Being called of Christ is to be one of his disciples. Ask yourself this question. Are you a believer or a follower? Trusting in Jesus Christ is fundamental, but doing so is the first step of a person's faith, not the collimation of it. Our primary purpose is to take a long or a lifelong journey following in the Lord's footsteps, honoring him with our actions, speech, and always increasing in biblical wisdom. Very clear difference between believing and trusting and having faith in Christ. James is very clear on what faith is. It is a faith that has works. And he even makes it clear that faith without works is dead. A follower's life is summed up in this phrase complete obedience to Jesus. That's what a follower's life's about. In fact, Jesus defined Christians as those who prove their love by keeping his word. If you love me, 1 John, keep my commandments. And as a believer, we know his commandments are not burdensome. The one who successfully finds their way in life will lose that life, while the one who loses his life for Jesus will find it. One last word on this subject here. Let me say this very clearly. The one who says, I am a strong person and will make it in life will be understood to have done so by compromising their loyalty to God and Jesus. Let me say that again. The one person who says, I am strong, I'm a strong person and I will make it in life will be understood to have done so by compromising their loyalty to God and Jesus. Well, what do you mean by that? Because you're not strong. You can't make it on your own. We need Jesus. We should depend on Jesus with everything that we have. And I know a lot of you here who have been coming here for years, I know that that's what you do. That's what gets you through life sometimes is your faith and your trust in him. But when you stand there in pride, I'm a strong person and I will get, you know, you will get there but not very far, and it will lead to destruction. There's a way that seems right to a man, but that way leads to death. Now, verse 42, uh, 40 to 42, we see, uh, now this is interesting because now he talks about his disciples. And they're going to reject Jesus um, <clears throat> because of the gospel, and because they reject him, and they're not greater than their master, they will also reject the disciples. So he encourages the crowd to accept the disciples and not to come against them like they will against Jesus here. So he who receives 
He who receives you receives me, verse 40, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, surely I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. So in the same way that Jesus is to be received and not rejected, they should be receiving the disciples equally and they will have a reward also. Listen to what God said pertaining to Moses. You might remember this story and what was happening there below Mount Sinai with Moses and some of the people and they were coming up against him and his leadership. <clears throat> Numbers 12, 8 says, I speak, with him, I speak with him face to face, God said, even plainly and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Now imagine that. Moses saw the burning bush. He saw God there in Mount Sinai. And God is saying, look, I have a relationship with Moses. He has seen me. I've seen him face to face. And, and I spoke to him very clearly. Then he says to the people, why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Wow. If I have this relationship with Moses and I speak very clearly to him because he is my servant and he even has seen me, why weren't you not afraid to speak against him? He is my servant, not yours. He's my child. And yet you weren't afraid to speak against him. He is preparing the disciples' hearts and skin, in a sense, to have hard skin against those religious leaders and those people that will come against them. And so he says, he who receives or welcomes you receives me. Remember that. When you receive a prophet and a servant of the Lord, you receive the Lord. It's the same thing. To receive the 12 disciples is like receiving Jesus and receiving Jesus is like receiving God himself. When you honor those who teach, preach, and pastor the flock, it's like honoring Jesus and God. Those who preach and teach and pastor a flock, though, need to understand that they are representatives of God and they should represent God correctly also. And in verse 41 through 42, he provides the exposition of verse 40 there. So he says, he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's word. Now you can look at that in two ways. One is, is that, that if you receive a prophet, then whatever that prophet is doing, and by the way, there are no more prophets today, even during the time of Jesus, the last prophet was John the Baptist. Uh, those were Old Testament prophets. What he's talking about is the person as a prophet would do would speak for God on his behalf, the truth. And so today we have prophets in the sense that a pastor, a teacher, evangelist that are giving out the gospel, they're in a sense, in a, in a position of a prophet. And so you get to partake of their reward. So if, uh, well, let's just take, for instance, I'm going to South Sudan and I'll be teaching 110 chaplains who are going to go on the front line. In fact, last month, one of them just got killed and their lives are going to definitely be in danger. I get to participate in their work. Their chaplains preaching the gospel and then I will participate in their reward because I've poured into them. Same is true for you here. As you support me to go to Sudan, you will participate in the reward that I will receive by going to Sudan when you get to heaven. That's what he's talking about. Or there's another possibility. Your children come to this church and as they come to this church, they are taught by teachers. They get rewards in that they receive the word of God in truth and in love. Uh, they will benefit from that because when they go out to the world and, and, and are examples of truth and love and integrity and so forth, and people recognize that and, and acknowledge those things, those are the rewards for participating in a ministry that God has set up. And so there are rewards to be had by those who support those that are pastors, teachers, evangelists, and so forth, and prophets. So he says in verse 42, and whoever gives one of these little ones, and when he says little ones, he's talking about the, even the least of servants. It doesn't have to be a Greg Laurie or a Chuck Smith, 
but it could be me <laughs> in a little tiny church or, or Jerry Simmons who's been pastoring a church there in, in Corona for many years and has struggled and is small and so forth, you know. And if you go and you give him a cup of water, the least of my servants, uh, in the name of a disciple, surely I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. <clears throat> a cup of water at least, you know. He's not asking for much. It, it, whatever little help you can, you can give, give it. You know, people oftentimes ask me, well, how much should I give? And I'm amazed that people don't give to the Lord. It, it blows me away. It really does. I, I've been giving since I got saved because it's a principle in the Bible and I want to be obedient to it. There was a time where I couldn't give anymore because I had exhausted all my savings, but I just wanted to be obedient to the Lord. So I just told him, I said, I know I can't do it like I was doing it. So this is what I can do. And I'm going to give it to you. And then as you increase my household, I will increase to you. And he was faithful enough to do that where I got, you know, wage increases, you know, cost of living and, and various things, inheritances and things like that. And I gave my 10% to the Lord and I worked my way up. And that's what he's saying here. Even if you just give a little, you know, if you don't give it all, shame on you. Can I say that with love? Shame on you. You should at least give a dollar. I mean, that you can afford a cup of coffee. You get a cup of coffee every day, you know, at least give a cup of coffee to the Lord, a dollar. If you can get a you know, dollar's too much than 50, do something, you know, saying, Lord, this is my heart. I want to just give this to you. Do something, even if it's a cup of water. And the Lord says, you will not lose your reward. Let me close. <clears throat> this application, and I think it's very simple and clear, and I think you totally get it. Just love God. Love God first, before and above all things. There's a story of a little girl, four-year-old girl, hugging a doll. She had them in her puny and pudgy little arm, just hugging the dolls and, you know, squeezing them and, you know, just saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. And the mom came in and saw her daughter hugging and squeezing. And all of a sudden the little girl says, I just love them so much, but, but they just don't tell me they love me. What's going on, you know? And that's kind of like us sometimes. God just loves us and loves us and loves us and loves us. And he just wants to be loved. That's one thing he wants from us is just to love him with our hearts. So the application this morning, but just obey his word, obey his word. That's revealing your love for him. Father God in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your word. They're challenging. Definitely, Lord. 